WLRN edition 78 broadcasting in three, two, one. I was born a woman off my knees. I will stand for my liberation. Sisters rise again. I was born a woman off my knees. I will stand for my liberation. Rise and rise again. Greetings and welcome to the 78th edition podcast of Women's Liberation Radio News for this Thursday, October 6th, 2022. This is Sekhmet Sheowl, WLRN's resident lesbian feminist with a labrus to grind. This month's edition focuses on what happened recently on Turf Island, a.k.a. the UK, with the tribunal featuring Mermaids, a pro-gender identity charity, trying to cancel the charity status of the LGB Alliance, a lesbian, gay, and bisexual advocacy organization. We'll hear an interview Thistle did with Joe Bartosz, feminist journalist from the UK, who is following the story closely and writes for 4W Pub, the online feminist magazine. We'll also hear commentary about the whole ordeal from yours truly at the end of the show. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics, except for separatist feminism, is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. To start off today's edition, here's Liz Miller with her monthly Getting Organized segment, wherein she interviews a prominent feminist activist to learn more about her projects and what she did to achieve her activism goals. This month, Liz talks with Kim Stanley, co-organizer of the Volva Lounge, a yearly women's lounge that she runs at MFR, the Michigan Family Reunion. Hi, I'm here with Kim Stanley, and thanks for being here today, Kim. Thanks for having me, Liz. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the famous Volvo Lounge at Michigan Family Reunion. And I know this is something that you started with a couple of other women and um, that you had done at other women's festivals also. So could you tell me a little bit about like your kind of your history of going to women's festivals and how it led you to or inspired you to want to start the Volvo Lounge? Well, my history, I guess I went to Mishfest once in 2001 and I always wanted to go back and I never made it. And I found out that they were ending it in 2015 and I started frantically looking around for other festivals and I found the Ohio Lesbian Festival, which is not a very far drive for me. So I went to my first Ohio Lesbian Festival in 2016. And I found out while I was there about Michigan Family Reunion. So I've gone to all of those since I've found out about it. I think I've been to four. There have been four. And I've gone to every Ohio festival since as well. And also the Virginia Women's Festival I try to hit every year. So the Volvo Lounge actually started as a joke, kind of. About four years ago at the Ohio Lesbian Festival, I was there with my friend Amy and I had a screen tent set up and we had those large inflatable loungers that were popular a few years ago that look kind of like vulvas. (laughs) So we had like three of those. That was our only (laughs) that was our only uh, furniture that year. And we were joking around and I was like, oh, it's the Volvo Lounge. And we all (laughs) laughed and, you know, and it was just a joke and I kind of dropped it. And then um, we met Lonnie not long after, and Lonnie's this amazing seamstress. She sews all these amazing things. And I I asked her, I was like, do you think you can make a a banner that says the Volvo Lounge? And she was like, yeah. (laughs) So she made this awesome banner, and and we took it to the next Ohio Festival the next year, and it was, it just started. (laughs) So. And then how did it become, so, so at first it was kind of like, just for you and a couple friends, but then it became, at least at, I don't know how it is at the other festivals, but at least at MFR, it's in this very public area and it's really like welcoming for everyone at the festival. So how did that? Well, when we were at the Ohio festival, um, we had it set up right by our 
camp, but our camp was on a corner and it was like right by the road. So we had lots of people going past. And the first time we had it at MFR was three years ago. We set up in the woods by our, our campsite, which was nice. We had some people stop by and, uh, but I kind of liked, I like the, I like the traffic. You know what I mean? I like, I, I want it to be a space that welcomes women. I want it to be, you know, I've, I've had quite a few women thank me for, you know, for building this space and saying it's a soft landing spot, which I really like. And so we decided last year we were going to set it up in the back of the field where the stage is. And we got real popular real fast. So, I mean, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's really in a place where everyone sees because it's near the stage and it's near like the vendor area and it's near places where everyone walks by all the time. So it's really a crossroads. So everyone's going to see that it's there. What what do you have in there, first of all? It's gotten like, it seems like it's gotten more um, kind of sophisticated each year. We we do tend to add on to it every year. So I have a, like a camp chair love seat that I bring every year and we bring extra seating. You know, we have some extra camp chairs for everybody and we have a little coffee table for the middle and a rug that we put down. And um, last year, Lonnie got a bar. So we have a bar in there and, you know, just flags and decorations. And we, we seem to gather decorations every year. People donate things, you know, we have. Yeah. Well, I think people really love being there. Like, can you talk a little bit about what happens there? Like what, why do you think it's so popular? Why do people come there? I don't know, honestly. I mean, we just, um, I mean, it's, it's a welcoming space. We're welcoming people. We're generous by nature. You know, we try to have snacks. We try to have drinks for people. Um, but I, I really think it's just, it's just the conversations, you know, all of these different women from all of these different walks of life stop in and, and it's, you know, the energy is so, it's just so welcoming and so, so great. It's just like, you know, the festival itself is amazing and it's just kind of a, you know, this, this little oasis where you can just stop and have more of an intimate kind of connection with women and and have more intimate conversations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Liz and Kim. Next, we turn to a brief report from WLRN's Aurora Linnea on the Women's Declaration International USA Conference that happened the weekend of September 24th in Washington, D.C. Aurora had the chance to attend the conference and files this report. For one weekend this September, a swanky Washington, D.C. hotel ballroom was transformed into the nerve center for feminist revolt. The event was Women's Declaration International USA's first ever political convention, its theme, Reigniting the Women's Liberation Movement. From Friday the 23rd of September to Sunday the 25th, over 100 incendiary renegade females from all across the United States descended upon the nation's capital to convene and conspire towards one simple, modest goal, the total liberation of all women and girls. To find myself surrounded by these women felt like a miracle. It also felt surreal, given that after tumbling in late and dazed from an extended internment in airport delay purgatory, the first thing I saw was Phyllis Chesler's head projected on the wall, crimson glowing and afloat above the stage like the great and powerful Oz, minus all the flames and the fog machine. This singular vision set the tone for what would be a weekend of full-being immersion in feminist overstimulation. On Friday evening, we heard from our elder sister pioneers of feminism's 1970s second wave, women like Joe Freeman, Merle Hoffman, Kathy Sarachild, and of course, Phyllis Chesler. These women started the first consciousness-raising groups, edited the first feminist newsletters, established the first abortion clinics, and authored the first feminist classics. They laid the foundation for our movement today, and we have so much to learn from them. Saturday's program featured panel discussions on radical feminist structural analysis, grassroots activism, and women's writing, as well as a presentation on nonviolent civil disobedience from the ever-formidable Lear Keith with whom I had the opportunity to discuss large, fluffy dogs. I also attended a breakout session on opposition to the sex industry with Melissa Farley of Prostitution Research and Education and Redux's Genevieve Gluck. To sum up, porn culture is emergency-level desecration, socializing girls and women into dissociative masochism while generally mutilating human sexuality into a male supremacist weapon against life. It always has been, it's getting worse, and we need to end it now. 
After all that, we were treated to a dinner theater performance of Carolyn Gage's play, The Second Coming of Joan of Arc, by the phenomenally talented young lesbian actress Amanda Wagner. It was a much-needed reminder of the importance of creative work in nurturing feminist culture and vision. At times, I fear that in our urgency we've left the arts out of our current movement, but Wagner's performance of Gage's play showed we've not lost it completely and was a testament to why we must not let it go. On Sunday, we delved into women's leadership, women's communities, effective lobbying, and how to disagree with other women without becoming vicious, in spite of our patriarchal training to knock one another out, scrambling after what meager handfuls of bone dust the men in power will throw out for us. To this end, Lear Keith offered the sage advice that each of us has only one life, and what a pity it would be to squander it fighting on the internet. The day's highlight for me was Lorraine Nowlin and Suzanne Forbes Vierling's presentation on misogynoir, defined as hatred and prejudice against black women in particular. They discussed how black women are confined within what Forbes Vierling termed double patriarchy, oppressed first within black patriarchy, and then again within the broader white supremacist patriarchal system. Their conceptualization of black women's unique position offered far greater clarity than any intersectional, buzzwordy theorizing I've encountered. The convention wrapped up on Sunday with collective brainstorming on how we envisioned victory for the women's liberation movement. I was pleased to learn that, for many women in attendance, victory looked like nothing less than saving the world. I, too, believe that radical feminism's highest potential is the deliverance of the earth and all its creatures from man's reign of terror. Why should we settle for anything less? There's much, much more that I could share, so please do look out for a fuller review of my convention adventures on the WLRN blog. But for the moment, I'll finish by saying that I left the conference humbled to have shared space with so many driven, dissident women and uplifted to know that each woman I met was carrying forward the work of women's liberation in her own little part of the world. I could feel it, how our movement is spreading, how it's gaining force. As isolating as it can be to defend women in today's culture of unchecked misogyny, none of us are alone in the struggle. Events like WDI USA's convention are proof of that, and I hope we will start organizing more of them. Let's get together again soon, sisters. I miss you already. Thanks, Aurora. It is great to hear about radical feminists organizing in the U.S. You are listening to WLRN. Brought to you by the totally excellent radical feminists at Women's Women's Liberation Liberation Radio 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 News. News. Now we turn to WLRN's World News segment with Emily Ann Lawrenson for this Thursday, October 6th, 2022. Thanks, Sekhmet. Laura Favaro, a gender studies researcher at City University of London, interviewed 50 gender studies professors who mainly worked at universities in England. All of her interviewees considered themselves feminists and 14 described their views as gender critical. Laura said, quote, Among other experiences, my interviewees described complaints to and by management, attempts to shut down events, no platforming, disinvitations, intimidations, smears, and losing career progression opportunities, including being blocked from jobs, unquote. A few professors expressed being wary about sharing their views because they have families to take care of and fear losing their jobs. Even those who are more moderate in their views felt intimidated to ask questions or discuss and exchange ideas. One psychologist compared the situation to, quote, authoritarian regimes that like to police the thoughts and speech of their citizens, unquote. In Seoul, South Korea, women participated in a sit-down protest in solidarity with a woman who was killed at a subway. The 28-year-old woman had been stalked by her attacker for years, and despite a police investigation and a request to the courts for him to be detained, he was never imprisoned or given a restraining order. He murdered her the day before he was to be sentenced for stalking her. This incident has brought attention to Korea's lax stalking laws. Until last year, stalking was considered a misdemeanor that was punishable by a small fine. 
an anti-stalking law was passed, but many have argued that it is insufficient because the perpetrator can only be prosecuted with the consent of the victim, which would allow stalkers to harass their victims into dropping the charges. Since the new law went into effect last year, 7,152 stalking arrests have been made, but only 5% of the suspects were detained. And in cases where the police applied to the courts to get the suspect detained, one in three requests were denied. The country's Supreme Court has proposed that stalking suspects who are not detained should be given restraining orders. Women have spoken out after politicians defended an MP in France who admitted to slapping his wife. Adrian Quantinens, a senior figure in the radical left France Unbowed, or LFI party, was reported to the police by his wife. In a statement, he said, quote, In a context of extreme tension and mutual aggression, I slapped her. I profoundly regret this action, and I have said sorry many times, unquote. He also announced that he was withdrawing from his role as LFI coordinator. Politicians made statements of support for the MP, and blame the media for his failing marriage. Women's rights groups have condemned their support, and Sandrine Rousseau, an MP for France's Green Party, said, quote, Violence against women has many faces. None of them is acceptable. Unquote. A man has been charged with assault and possession of a knife after being arrested at the Let Women Speak event in Brighton, England. He will appear before the magistrate's court on October 13th. Standing for Women is a gender-critical organization that is run by Kelly J. Keene, aka Posey Parker, and counter-protesters who called themselves Reclaim Pride were agitators at the organization's Let Women Speak event. In a statement, Standing for Women said, quote, We will never be deterred or intimidated. What women faced on Sunday, a nasty, thuggish mob masquerading as activists, is exactly what we've come to expect. It's extraordinary that people get so angry when women gather to speak. What are they afraid we might say?" Unquote. Alaska, once again, has the highest rate of women killed by men in the United States. Every year in the past decade, Alaska has been either the state with the highest or second highest rate of women killed by men in the country. The When Men Murder Women analysis uses 2020 data from the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Database. The rate of Alaska Native women killed by men in the state is 12.63 per 100,000, which is more than 3.5 times the rate for all women in the state, and is 10 times higher than the rate for white women. Most women were killed with knives, blunt force, or objects. 92% of the victims knew their attacker, and more than half either were or had been in some kind of domestic relationship with the killer. Jennifer Scott of New Zealand had her practicing certificate suspended, which means she will no longer be able to practice as a nurse. It is believed her certificate was suspended because she is gender critical and criticizes COVID-19 vaccine mandates. She recently addressed the Dundian City Council and asked it to ensure designated sex-based private areas, such as changing rooms and bathrooms, would be upheld in all facilities funded or owned by the council. She was met with criticism from the council. In a Facebook post, Jennifer confirmed the suspension and said, quote, All because I have openly criticized the jab and state very clearly that a woman is an adult human female. They have not listened to any research I have sent them." Unquote. 22-year-old Masa Amini was arrested in Tehran by morality police for breaking the Iranian law that states women must wear a hijab. She fell into a coma shortly after collapsing at a detention center and died in police custody. It is believed that police beat Amini before she became comatose. Morality police are tasked, among other things, with ensuring women conform with the authorities' interpretation of proper clothing, and they can stop women and assess whether they are showing too much hair, their pants and overcoats are too short or close-fitting, or they are wearing too much makeup. 
Punishments for violating the rules include a fine, prison, or flogging. Women have been protesting in the streets and burning their hijabs in response to the murder. One protester said, quote, The police kept firing tear gas. Our eyes were burning. We were running away, but they cornered me and beat me. They were calling me a prostitute and saying I was out in the street to sell myself, unquote. Another protester offered a different perspective, stating, quote, While we were out waving our headscarves in the sky, I felt so emotional to be surrounded and protected by other men. It feels great to see this unity. I hope the world supports us, unquote. Italians marched through Rome, Milan, and other cities in support of protecting access to abortion, which many fear will be under threat by a far-right party expected to form the next government after leading in parliamentary elections. Organizers announced that they fear the government could impose, quote, rigid gender roles and assign women the task of reproduction and growth of a white, patriarchal, and heterosexual nation. Unquote. Italian law allows for abortion on request in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy or later if a woman's health or life is in danger. Many Italians also fear that the 2016 law legalizing same-sex unions will be at risk under a conservative government. On Saturday, October 8th, I will be in Anaheim, California, covering the first Do No Harm Unity Rally in front of the American Academy of Pediatrics Convention. The protesters aim to raise awareness about the medicalization of gender nonconforming children. It will be a peaceful, nonpartisan education rally for the 10,000 pediatricians attending the convention. Check out our YouTube channel at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on October 8th for live coverage with myself and Amy Sousa. That concludes WLRN's World News segment for Thursday, October 6th. I'm Emily Ann Lorenzen. Share your news stories, announcements, and tips with us by emailing info at womensliberationradionews.com and letting us know what's going on. That was the Farsi version of the World War II Italian resistance song Bella Ciao, as sung by two Iranian women. The WLRN Collective stands with Iranian women in their resistance to violent male supremacy. On Tuesday of this week, Women's Declaration International, at the behest of Iranian women protesting the murder of Massa Amini, put out a call for seven-second or less anonymous videos of women voicing solidarity with Iranian women. Participate in that campaign by sending your videos to stelladoves at outlook.com. That's S-T-E-L-L-A-D-O-V-E-S at outlook.com. Be sure you do not mention your name. You can say your country, your profession, and or that you're a feminist. And be sure to include, I stand with the women of Iran. Deadline for submissions is tomorrow, October the 7th. Next up, we'll hear an interview Thistle did with Joe Bartosh about the recent events surrounding a British tribunal involving mermaids, a pro-trans organization, and LGB Alliance, a pro-lesbian, gay, and bisexual organization. Joe Bartosh is a widely commissioned journalist with a specialist interest in the turf wars. 
She's regularly published in the UK's largest news outlets from The Times to The Telegraph. You can read her column at 4W Pub and follow her on Twitter at Joe underscore Bartosh. Okay, so I've got Joe Bartosh with me here. Welcome, Joe, to WLRN. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Fantastic. Yeah. So before we get started talking about Mermaids versus LGB Alliance and the Tribunal, can you just introduce yourself to our listeners? Tell us a little bit about how you became a feminist campaigner and your journalism career over there in the UK. Yeah, of course. Um, so I actually came uh, quite an unusual, quite an unusual route to, uh, to journalism, really. So I've always been a campaigner. And I used to run just a, a small feminist group in my hometown. And um, and as part of that, the sort of, you know, the sex-based rights thing started to emerge as an issue. To start with, I didn't get it. Um, and then when the penny dropped, I was just like, oh, my God, this is awful. I have to tell everybody immediately. <laughs> um, which obviously then everything sort of, you know, disintegrated and blah, blah, blah. But oddly, because so as, as part of that, as part of sort of running the group, I was offered a column at my local newspaper. Um, just to sort of put forward sort of feminist opinions. And I had no idea that I could write. So this is um, 10 years ago now, I guess, thereabouts. I had no idea that I had any aptitude for it. Started writing, and that sort of built up my confidence, just getting in the local paper. Then I started pitching to national papers, always on feminist topics, and then got picked up. And then when this particular issue broke, there were so few journalists who were prepared to write on it, I kind of found a niche. So um, after a few years, I was able to give up my sort of day job and just focus on writing about specifically about um, the threat to women's sex-based rights and indeed the threat to our identity um, from, from trans activism. So, yes, yeah, so not, a, not a standard route, um, but it's actually the campaigning came first and then the journalism. So I'm, I'm not a sort of, you know, an impartial BBC-style reporter. What I write is opinion, and it tends to be, because that's a hot topic, that's what I get commissioned on. I have a question. Is there uh, an American equivalent to you here in the United States that you know of? I mean, because I don't know any paid journalists who get to write about their opinion on women's sex based rights with a criticism of transgenderism here in the U.S., I suspect there probably are in the right leaning press opinion journalists who sort of share their opinion on a variety of topics and that sort of allows them to to to, to approach it. I'm not really aware of any um who are employed on a freelance basis. I guess Jennifer Billick. Yeah. I suppose she's yeah, got her own, she sort of carved her own niche and obviously um, came to it through campaigning and is now quite widely published. I suppose Clara Dansky to an extent, though I know she's primarily a lawyer. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe it is a peculiarly British thing um, mm-hmm. that um, the, 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 she's emerged. The publications that are um, publishing you, would you say they're left-leaning, right-leaning, um, middle of the road, what, um, variety? Yeah, I mean, for the most part... Um, I think they are what would stereotypically be termed right. I mean, I, I tend to think that um, the old delineation between right and left is pretty irrelevant now, to be honest. And I, I heard someone recently describe it as um, perhaps a, a more apt way of phrasing the divisions that we're seeing are between those who trust institutions and those who don't trust institutions. And actually, I think that makes a lot more sense. So those that are right for tend to be um, publications which will um publishing that are quite critical of institutions which i suppose in stereoty- in, in, in old money if you like would be seen as on the right so it'll be spiked it'll be telegraph it'll be occasionally spectator it'll be critic so i mean i don't like to think of free thought and free expression as something that is aligned with the right but i think because the left have done such a terrible job of advocating for freedom of speech they have allowed that division to emerge mm-hmm Interesting. Does that make sense? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So um, can you talk, talk to us a little bit about the tribunal and um, how it came about recently in UK society? What, what are tribunals exactly? And what was this most recent 
tribunal featuring the LGB Alliance and mermaids about? Okay, so a tribunal, it's just a different type of court. So um, they always deal with civil cases. So that's basically anything that isn't criminal. Um, and they don't have a jury. So they have a panel of experts. So they're more specialist. And this one, it wasn't technically between the LGB Alliance and mermaids. Technically, it was between the Charity Commission and mermaids. So mermaids are sort of like our equivalent, I guess, of glad, but with a child focus. Well, maybe not glad. They're more basically they're a, a, a trans lobby group masquerading as a <laughs> as a children's charity. They're, in my opinion, they are a bit dodgy, and they are headed by a woman who took her son or her child when um, when he was uh, for his sixteenth birthday. She took him to Thailand and. Um, and he had a false exchange operation. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think it's fair to say that she has some, some skin in the game on this. Um, and the organisation that she heads has been supported by um, quite high profile celebrities across the world. In the UK, we've had some minor royal support mermaids. So, you know, it's, they're quite a, a big deal. Um, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She did. US. She did indeed raise money for them. And yeah, so um, the LGB Alliance uh, were founded, I think, in 2019. And the women at the heart of it, I mean, there were some men at the heart of it as well, but the women at the heart of it were there at the very early days of um, both the women's movement and the sort of lesbian, uh, gay, gay and lesbian sort of liberation movement. So, you know, they're really long standing campaigners. And um, they simply noticed what was happening with um, with the definition of what it is to be same sex attracted, and they pushed back against it because in the UK all of our mainstream LGB organisations now primarily focus on the T, because obviously once you suggest that um, sexual orientation is in fact based on gender identity, you obliterate what it is to be same sex or indeed opposite sex attracted. You essentially say everybody's bisexual. It's it's a bit bonkers. So they set up with that very clear purpose and they applied for charity status and that was granted. And the minute it was granted, the, the trans activists went absolutely mental. So we have the Good Law Project, who um, are an organisation run by Jolyn Warm, who's a sort of a, a Casey and a so that's King's Council. So he's a lawyer. Um, though actually his specialism is tax. <laughs> but um, um, and sort of all these quite big sort of movers and shakers uh, immediately started lobbying the Charity Commission to reconsider their decision. When they made their decision, they actually published a very long explanation, which wasn't very generous. It was rather rather mean spirited, I thought. But they did publish a very long explanation setting out exactly why they had come to the conclusion that the LGB Alliance existed for the public good, because that's what you know, you have to meet a criteria of being a charity, you have to submit various criteria and basically to serve the public interest. Now, mermaids, part of the reason they were granted standing to oppose the Charity Commission decision was because they argued that the existence of the LGB alliance might detract from their funding, which isn't to say that necessarily their funders would would give money to um to the LGB alliance instead of to mermaids it's more to say they were worried that their reputation would be damaged by the actions of the LGB alliance um so that's why they were allowed to take the case which which i think is kind of quite telling in itself um and the case which is still ongoing technically so they've got some um, closing statements in a in a month or so um, has been, I mean, it's been a car crash. It's been brilliant. So it was brought by mermaids, and yet it has exposed them um, in in the most sort of brutal and and open of context. Because obviously, nonsensical mantras don't stand up in a court of law, yeah. <laughs> and um, they got to choose their own witnesses, and they chose somebody. So Paul Roberts, who was the head of the LGB T consortium. Um, and he stood there and basically said, oh, I'm not an expert. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm not an expert throughout his testimony. I mean, he, he was supposed to be, you know, that, he, that, that he, was, he was there to put their case and he just totally failed to do so. 
Then there was um, the head of um, their chair, their charitable chair, uh, whose name is Belinda Bell, Dr. Belinda Bell, although she's not a medical doctor. And just throughout her evidence, again, she was saying, oh, well, you know, mermaids aren't a medical organisation. Yet at the same time, they have been referred to in other cases as the experts, as sort of, you know, the medical experts on this. So she basically admitted that they didn't have any expertise and they didn't really know what they were doing. Um, although obviously she wouldn't see it like that. And I should probably be a little bit careful because I don't want to be seem to be prejudicing anything with um with what I say but I think I, th- I think that's fairly indisputable and she also came out with the cracking line which was babies are born without a sex I mean just absolutely bonkers then um was all of this broadcast um no somewhere? annoyingly not it was so there's a an organization called tribunal tweets on twitter and they recorded a lot of it but unfortunately um we're not allowed um they're not allowed to broadcast from courtrooms um in the uk so it was a sort of you had to um it was like a hybrid hearing so there were some people in the public gallery and then there were some people who were admitted and like these cases are normally so niche and so tiny and it is the first time that one charity has challenged the charitable standing of another so it's quite a unique case but i think they were expecting it to be quite niche and obviously they were totally unprepared for the fact that the eyes of the world particularly sort of journalistic world were on them because it was such a, a landmark and exciting and interesting case. Did the quote-unquote liberal press cover it as well? Actually, yes, he did. So um, there's a journalist called Amelia Gentleman um, who covered it for The Guardian, who are sort of, well, actually you've got The Guardian in the US as well, haven't you? Yes, so basically they are sort of mainstream left-leaning paper. And she did quite a good job of being quite balanced about it, which was the first for The Guardian because they've sort of chosen to ignore things. I think in part because their revenue is driven by the US audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've always been very cautious, but they actually gave quite she gave quite a good balanced um report on it. Um and when it came to um the evidence given by oh god, do you want to tell you about the evidence that was given by an MP? Sure. <laughs> okay, oh, so this is oh, this was just mind blowing. So we've got um a particularly um I I, well, I think he's a very unpleasant man called John Nicholson. And um, he was reprimanded a couple of times by the judge because um, because he was such a prick, basically. Um, and um, he um, came out with lots of claims about how the LGB alliance had harassed him, but then wasn't able to um, evidence any of it. Then he said to the uh, lawyer for um, the LGB alliance, anyone who's a lesbian, who says she's a lesbian, is oh, no, so anyone who claims to be a lesbian is a lesbian. I mean, just what? What? And um, anyway, so he's a, he, he didn't come out until he was sort of nearly 40, I think, and yet has set himself up as some sort of, you know, long-standing gay rights champion. He also said in Parliament once that um, had he had been given the option at 16 of taking a pill to be straight, he would have. And yet he seems totally unable to recognise that it is essentially that which is being offered to the children who are identifying as trans, you know, the gay kids or the sort of proto-lesbian kids who are identifying as trans. So he's quite contradictory, clearly hasn't thought things through, but he's a very, very angry man. And um, he made all sorts of claims that um, that I don't think were that well substantiated um, and um, made a bit of an arse of himself, to be honest, which was very gratifying. Um, and um, I, I'm really sorry. I feel I feel like I should have probably kept some of his quotes because he did come out with some just spectacularly mad things. So anyone who identifies as a lesbian is a lesbian. Was that pushed further to say that a man can be a lesbian? Well, that was so later on when um, uh, the um, witnesses for the LGBT Alliance, so namely uh, Kate Harris and um, Bev Jackson, both of whom are sort of, used to say, long-standing lesbian campaigners. Um, the mermaid's lawyer was clearly instructed to ask, and I actually think he felt rather guilty about it. Um, he asked um, Kate Harris whether she was open to the possibility that there were interpretations of the word lesbian other than hers. And she replied to him, what, do you mean lesbians with penises? And um, he was, uh, he started... Um, sort of equivocating and just sort of waffling on, then she burst into tears, Um, which actually I totally understand because, my God, to have fought for lesbian rights for that long 
and to then find herself having to explain to some prick of a lawyer no only women can be lesbians of course she burst into tears and then she came back fighting and said no the word lesbian is taken you do not get to use that from us take that from us and gave a really powerful rebuttal which is to say it's all on tribunal treats um I ca- i've covered some of it um it's been quite widely covered in the uk so look it up because there were some beautiful quotes from the hearing and um and my god it was just i mean considering that this was a case that was brought by mermaids supposedly to expose the lgb alliance it backfired so spectacular and so what is the official result of this of them bringing this they have not lost their charity status right lgb alliance it hasn't actually concluded yet the case, oh, which is why I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit cagey about what I say. So um, I think just because of the way the court system works and court time and all the rest of it, they haven't yet given their closing statements. The closing statements, I think, are happening in November. I think it's around about November the 7th. And then there will probably be a further delay whilst the judge presides over the ruling. Um, but I would imagine probably before Christmas, we we'll know one way or another. Um, I think what's interesting and what will be interesting is if i think either way the lgb alliance are probably going to win because if they are found to have engaged in political activities and not to have done enough um charitable activity obviously they will lose their charitable status which will be a shame on the one hand but on the other hand it will then open the door for lots of cases against their opponents because stonewall mermaids all of us sort of mainstream trans organizations lobby they're not just charities they are lobby groups so if they find that the lgb alliance have been lobbying and are political they will have to do so in a way for for all of these other groups if they get to hang on to their charitable status and continue to do what they've been doing, which has been hard for them because they have been sort of spending an awful lot of time putting together witness statements, putting together bundles, you know, it's it's, it's taken a lot of their energy and they organise conferences and all the rest of it. So if they um, keep their charitable status, great. But if they lose it, I actually, I don't think it'd be the worst thing in the world. Hmm. Interesting. And then does this tribunal change the hearts and minds of people? So even if they lose their charitable status, um, maybe this, the, the trans ideology has been exposed by the process of this tribunal. I mean, is you know, culture change is happening too, right? Yeah, I mean, I think more widely within the UK, we are starting to see um, lots of court cases where trans ideology is finally being scrutinised. And I think sunlight is the best disinfectant because um, once any of their statements are scrutinised by people who are trained in logic, essentially, they fall apart (laughs) because it's clearly nonsense. Um, So that's been really satisfying to watch. And we've seen... So other cases that are going on like at the moment, and I know there are similar cases in Canada and the States or the rest of it, um, but other cases we've got going on at the moment, so there's um, uh, a chap in Ireland who I think is a bit of a religious nut, to be fair, but he's been imprisoned um, for breaking um, a condition whereby basically he was told that um, he'd misgendered a student and he was banned from the school and then he now he's in prison. school and he's been imprisoned for beach breaching the conditions of like he was told he couldn't go into the school onto the school property so in effect he's been in prison for misgendering which is pretty bonkers i mean he is i think a bit of a religious loon to be honest but it doesn't matter he sure shouldn't be in prison for refusing to use right. somebody's bloody pronoun um there's another case which is a chaplain a school chaplain called bernard randall Mm-hmm. who was reported by his by teachers at the school where he was sort of you know i don't know ministering whatever chaplains do um because he gave a, a sermon in which he criticized um um a group called educate and celebrate who are a trans activist group who had gone into the school and taught teachers to chant um smash uh, heteronormativity which you know as a, as, a, as a chaplain, of course, that's opposed to his Christian values. You know, it's, mm-hmm, I 
don't necessarily agree with him. I don't necessarily agree with them. But, you know, he should be free to express that. And because he made that point in a sermon to um, to the students at his Church of England school, because he said, you know, I think we need to be open to a plurality of viewpoints. You don't have to agree with LGBT stuff, clearly meaning the educate and celebrate stuff. He was reported as a potential terrorist risk. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. And so in the general population that is hopefully hearing about this, um, it, is the conversation changing? Like when you go to a family gathering or a friendship gather, gathering, going out to the bar, are people changing their minds in the UK? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I mean, I think we have a, a less polarized and a less captured media than in the US, um, from, from what I understand, not having ever been to the US, but just from what I've seen. Um, and yeah, I think it's definitely becoming, um, it's definitely becoming, so during the Conservative Party leadership elections that we had, um, it was just only members of the Conservative Party were allowed to vote on it, but there was a leadership race for um, somebody to replace um, Prime Minister, let's trust as our new Prime Minister. And during that, the issue of what is a woman, which I think actually was first asked to a UK politician by campaigner Kelly J. Keane. Um, so, and she, she runs the group Standing for Women. So that has gone from being sort of very, very niche issue. So when I first tried to raise that with my MP like years ago, he just laughed at me. It was just something, you know, now I've got like a, a standard um, trans women are women letter back. Um, and now it has become a key political issue. It is starting to be acknowledged on the left as an issue primarily because they can't afford to ignore it because the right have now sort of recognised it effectively. And who can blame them? So it is becoming a political issue and it is being recognised as a, as a potential vote winner. So I think actually, yes, it has kind of filtered through to the wider population. Great. And people are not feeling afraid to have a conversation about it. Um. I mean, I think people at work, even though we had a, a, the, the starter ruling here, which was, um, I'm sure people are probably aware, so my first starter. Oh, um, yeah. Fired. Yes. That has been a game changer. So I think people are still a little bit cautious at work to push back against things like pronouns in bios and those that are in signatures. And I think there is, it is still very much embedded in institutions. But I think just having that awareness that you cannot legally anyway be fired for expressing uh, gender critical views um, or reality based views, yeah, as one might otherwise say, fantastic. has changed things. Yeah. And did you hear about Marie Volbrick's case in, yes, um, in, Germany? in Germany? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to be changing things too um, and setting a precedent. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's funny. I've never been particularly patriotic or, you know, I really don't give a toss about being sort of British, but it does make me quite proud to see yeah, that we are sort of pushing this. <laughs> for sure. And I mean, yeah. to be to be t on Turf Island with J.K. Rowling, our queen, <laughs> I mean, she, I, wow. I, I hope I get to meet her someday. Have you met her? No, 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 no. Okay. I mean, I, the nearest I get is we follow each other on Twitter and, you know, very occasionally I might have a tweet liked and I get all excited. Aww. But um, <laughs> but no, I've never met her. Yeah. <laughs> Angela Wilde got to have lunch with her. She did indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, I've got my J.K. Rowling. I love J.K. Oh, I see. Nicely. Shirt nicely on. <laughs> <laughs> I wore it to the last um, Free Speech for Women event here in Madison because um, one of our thrift stores, St. Vincent de Paul, the trans activists were criticizing them for having J.K. Rowling you know, like Harry Potter series stuff at the at the thrift store. And the Joking. thrift store managers wrote a public apology to the transgender community or whatever, you know. So that's the town that I live in here in Joking. Madison. <laughs> and so Joking. that's why I wore this T-shirt to to the um, Free Speech for Women event. It's like... To be, be the billboard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, um, thank you so much for giving us a, a rundown on the basics of what a tribunal is and 
um, what's been going on with the charitable status of the LGB Alliance and mermaids challenging it and just, you know, all of the writing that you're doing and the, and the work that you're doing for girls and women. It's just, it's been awesome to have you on the show. So thank, thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for what you do and for inviting me. Really nice to speak to you. This is Joe Brew, and you are listening to WLRN. For years now, the transgender movement and its supporters have made their anti-homosexual and anti-female agenda crystal clear. Nothing illustrates that agenda more than their persistent efforts to silence and destroy groups of homosexuals and groups of women who aren't actually attacking transgenderism, but who instead simply want their own spaces, activities, and company. The Mermaids organization attempting to legally block LGB Alliance from holding charity status, which would make it very difficult for LGBA to exist at all, is just the most recent example of trans activists taking action not to secure their own rights, whatever those are supposed to be, and creating their own spaces, but to prevent other people from organizing for their own interests. Notice that homosexual organizations and activists have never attempted to legally or socially eliminate trans groups, events, or spaces. Women haven't either. LGB Alliance hasn't attacked mermaids with any serious attempt at shutting them down, and certainly did not form for the sole purpose of challenging transgender ideology. Yet trans activists can't stand to see LGBA exist, simply because LGBA doesn't ideologically conform to transgenderism or include the trans agenda within their own. Get the L out and LGB without the T which are really more slogans and social media hashtags than full-blown sociopolitical movements, have also been met with fierce resistance and criticism. It's exceptionally creepy to watch trans activists and self-identified queer people, who, let me remind you, are usually bisexual, in heterosexual relationships, or just plain heterosexual, try to insist on forced association between themselves and lesbians, or themselves and the wider population of LGB people wanting to assert their independence from the QT. These Q and T creeps deride LGB separation from them with lies about how trans activists are the only reason homosexuals have rights, and with the kind of statements that abusers the world over have spat at their victims. There is no you without me. How any adult with a working brain could look at the rhetoric and the actions of queer and trans activists in the conversation about splitting the LGB from the QT and believe that it's the QT population being victimized is beyond me. At the heart of all this drama is the same desire fueling heteropatriarchy, that of the oppressor to maintain access to the oppressed for the purpose of controlling and using the oppressed. There's a deep, sick sense of entitlement involved, too. The oppressor always feels like he has a natural right to access, control, and use the oppressed. It doesn't matter what the oppressed population wants, needs, or feels. The oppressed population is, as far as the oppressor is concerned, here for the sole pleasure and benefit of the oppressor. The oppressed don't get to have boundaries. Boundaries are limits that we set ourselves between us and others to protect our well-being. Boundaries are exactly what these trans activists and their queer cronies love to violate and hate to see homosexuals and women asserting. That complete disrespect of and even hostility toward another person's boundaries is the quintessential rapist mentality. Who the hell are these people to tell lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals we can't organize, we can't have our own exclusive groups, we can't throw our own events, we can't focus on ourselves personally and politically? The audacity of these trans activists. They get to do whatever they want and have whatever they want, including trans-only things, and the world is obligated to treat that right as sacred. But the rest of us can only work and play in ways they approve of? 
not believing in gender is grounds for being shut down by these people at a legal level, but espousing that homosexuals are morally obligated to have heterosexual intercourse shouldn't attract identical resistance? If it isn't obvious to you by now that the transgender movement is heterosexist and that the people behind it are abusive, predatory, and oppressive to lesbians, gay men, and even bisexuals who step out of line, I don't know what will make it obvious. In any case, the behavior that trans and queer activists have displayed toward homosexuals and bisexuals who try to assert boundaries and to independently organize and socialize only further justifies and motivates the LGB splitting from the QT. Only a toxic abuser, predator, tries to force you to stay in relationship with him when you clearly don't want to. It's my hope that more and more lesbians and gay men of all ages, but especially the youth, recognize the abusive and predatory behavior coming from the QT and get behind splitting up the acronym. An acronym and the non-existent, all-encompassing community it's supposed to symbolize that homosexuals never collectively voted on or consented to. Thanks for listening to WLRN's 78th edition podcast on the Mermaids Tribunal in the UK. WLRN would like to thank our guest this month for sharing her views and information on the topic. Thank you so much, Joe Bartosh, for speaking with us. Until next time, this is Thistle signing off on another WLRN podcast. If you like what you are hearing and would like to donate to the cause of Feminist Community Radio, please visit our WordPress site and click on the Donate button. Check out our merch tab to get a nice gift in exchange for your donation. And if you are interested in joining our team, we are always looking for new volunteers to conduct interviews, write blog posts, post to our Facebook and other social media pages, and do other tasks to keep us moving forward as a collective of media activist women. Thanks for listening. This is Jenna, signing off for now. And I'm Aurora. Thanks for tuning in. Next month, we will focus our program on the male sex right, the subtitle of Sheila Jeffrey's latest book, entitled Penile Imperialism, the Male Sex Right and Women's Subordination. Join me as I talk with the author and delve into this important, albeit somewhat stomach-churning topic. Our handcrafted podcasts always come out the first Thursday of the month, so look for it on Thursday, November 3rd. If you'd like to receive our newsletter that notifies you when each podcast, music show, and interviews are released, please sign up for our newsletter on the WLRN WordPress site. Stay strong in the struggle, and thank you for listening. This is Emily Ann signing off on another edition of WLRN's monthly handcrafted podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Spinster, Over It, and SoundCloud in addition to our WordPress site. Thanks for listening. And finally, I'm Sekhmet Shiawal. Our monthly podcasts are always crafted with tender loving care and in solidarity with women worldwide. Thanks for your support. We would love to hear from you, so please comment, like, and share widely. But how will we find our way out of this? What is the antidote for the patriarchal kiss?